Greetings and welcome to the Fair Isaac Corporation quarterly earnings call. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, we will conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. If at any time during the conference you need to reach an operator, please press star 0. And as a reminder, this conference is being recorded Thursday, January 25th, 2024. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to David Singleton. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining FICO's first quarter earnings call. I'm Dave Singleton, Vice President of Investor Relations, and I'm joined today by our CEO, Will Lansing, and our CFO, Steve Weber. Today, we issued a press release that describes financial results compared to the prior year, and on this call, management will also discuss results in comparison with the prior quarter to facilitate an understanding of the run rate of the business. Certain statements made in this presentation are forward-looking under the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Those statements involve many risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially. Information concerning these risks and uncertainties is contained in the company's filings with the SEC, particularly in the risk factors and forward-looking statements portion of such filings. Copies are available from the SEC, from the FICO website, or from our investor relations team. This call will also include statements regarding certain non-GAAP financial measures. Please refer to the company's earnings release and Regulation G schedule issued today for a reconciliation of each of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most comparable GAAP measure. The earnings release and Regulation G schedule are available on the Investor Relations page of the company's website at FICO.com or on the SEC's website at SEC.gov. And a replay of this webcast will be available through January 25th 2025. Now I will turn the call over to our CEO, Will Lansing. Thanks, Dave, and thank you everyone for joining us for our first quarter earnings call. In the Investor Relations section of our website, we posted some financial highlight slides that we'll be referencing during our talk today. I am so pleased to report that we had a great start to our fiscal year, with double-digit growth in revenue, net income, and EPS versus last year. It was a solid quarter, and we're well positioned for our fiscal 2024. As shown on page two of the first quarter financial highlights, we reported first quarter revenues of 382 million, up 11% over last year. We delivered 121 million of gap net income in the quarter, up 24%, and gap earnings of $4.80 per share, up 25% from the prior year. On a non-gap basis, quarter one net income was $121 million, with earnings of $4.81 per share, up 12% and 13% respectively. We delivered free cash flow of 121 million in our first quarter, up 32% versus prior year. We continue to return capital to our shareholders through buybacks. In quarter one, we repurchased 78,000 shares at an average price of $915 per share. This month, we exhausted the remainder of the 2022 repurchase authorization, and we announced a new $500 million authorization this week. In our score segment, as you can see from page six, our first quarter revenues were 192 million, up 8% versus the prior year. On the B2B side, the current quarter revenues were up 12% versus the prior year. This is a strong result, considering the impact of higher interest rates on loan origination volumes, and also the Latin America license renewal that we had in Q1 of 2023. On the B2C side, the current quarter revenues were down 3% versus the prior year. First quarter mortgage originations revenues were up 188% versus the prior year. Auto originations were down 3%. Credit card, personal loan, and other originations revenues were down 5% versus the prior year. We continue to see traction with our latest score, FICO score 10T. So you'll recall last quarter we announced that Movement Mortgage was an early adopter of FICO 10T. This quarter we announced that Cross Country Mortgage which is the nation's number three retail mortgage lender, will use FICO 10T to analyze its non-conforming loans. They are the first lender originating loans to be issued in a mortgage-backed security based exclusively on the FICO score 10T. These clients, in addition to others, have signed up to demonstrate to investors and to rating agencies and to other stakeholders a real-world example of the improved predictive performance offered by FICO score 10T. In our software segment, we delivered $190 million in quarter one revenue, up 14% from last year. We continue to drive strong growth 
in ARR and NRR through our Land and Expand strategy, with Expand driven by increased customer usage. As you can see on page 7, total ARR was up 18%, with platform ARR growth growing 43%, and non-platform ARR growing 11%. Total NRR for the quarter, shown on page 8, was 114%, with platform NRR at 136%, and non-platform NRR at 108%. We do continue to see strong demand from our new customers. Our total ACV bookings for the quarter were 18 million, a good result after a particularly strong fourth quarter. We continue to have a robust pipeline of opportunities, particularly with FICO platform offerings. We've expanded our FICO platform reach both by geography and by customer type. In December, we launched FICO platform with an event in India, and we've already had several early adopters looking to expand to multiple use cases. In the UK, Step Change Debt Charity, a market leader, will use the FICO platform to provide individual outcomes to consumers seeking to become debt-free. Our biggest opportunity near term continues to be in North America, where banks are focused on digital transformation and understand the value of the FICO platform, where data-driven analytics allow hyper-personalized decisioning in consumer interactions on a real-time basis. We continue to innovate and bring new capabilities to the FICO platform and work with new customers to demonstrate value and with existing customers to expand use cases. Our innovation will be highlighted at this year's FICO World event, which will take place in San Diego in April. I'll have more on that later, but for now, let me turn the call over to Steve for further financial details. Thanks, Will, and good afternoon, everyone. As Will mentioned, we had another very good quarter with total revenue of $382 million, an increase of 11% over the prior year, or 12% when adjusted for last year's divestiture. Score segment revenues for the quarter were $192 million, up 8% from Q1 of 2023. B2B revenues were up 12%, driven by mortgage originations revenues. Our growth would have been higher if not for the Latin American license revenue, which we'll talk about in Q1 of 2023 that did not recur this year. Our B2C revenues were down 3% versus the prior year due to declines in our MyFICO business, partially offset by our licensed B2C business. Score segment revenues in the first quarter were $190 million, up 14% versus Q1 of 2023, or 17% when adjusted for the divestiture. This quarter, 83% of total company revenues were derived from our Americas region, which is a combination of our North America and Latin America regions. Our EMEA region generated 10% of revenues, and the Asia Pacific region delivered 7%. Our total software ARR was $688 million, an 18% increase over the prior year. Platform ARR was $190 million, representing 28% of our total Q1-24 ARR, up from 23% of total Q1-23 ARR. Platform ARR grew 43% versus the prior year, while non-platform ARR grew 11% to $497 million this quarter. Our platform land and expand strategy continues to be very successful. Our dollar-based net retention rate in the quarter was 114% versus 110% last year. Platform NRR was 136% versus 130% in the prior year, while our non-platform NRR was 108% versus 103% in the prior year. Non-platform ARR growth was driven by customers' increased usage and CPI price increases. Our software ACV bookings for the quarter were $18.3 million versus $21.5 million in the prior year. We view this as a successful sales quarter, coming off a record quarter in our fourth quarter of 23. Remember that ACV bookings include only the annual value of software sales and exclude professional services. Turning now to our expenses for the quarter, total operating expenses were $231 million this quarter versus $205 million in the prior year. Our current quarter expenses are a 3% increase from the prior quarter, which was $224 million. As we indicated last quarter, we maintain our focus on investment to accelerate development and distribution of the FICO platform. And as a reminder, our incremental investment is relatively modest and is already built into our guidance. Our non-GAAP operating margin is shown in our Reg G schedule was 48% for the quarter. 
gap net income this quarter was $121 million, up 24% from the prior year's quarter. Adjusting for excess tax benefit and the prior year's side round divestiture, our one year-over-year gap net income grew 14%. Our non-gap net income was $121 million for the quarter, up 12% from the prior year's quarter. The effective tax rate for the quarter was 7% and included $24 million of reduced tax expense from excess tax benefits recognized upon the settlement or exercise of employee stock awards. In the prior year, the excess tax benefit was $10 million. We believe that our fiscal year 2024 net effective tax rate will be around 22%, while our recurring tax rate is expected to be around 26%. Again, the recurring tax rate is before any excess tax benefit and other discrete items. Free cash flow for the quarter was $121 million, a 32% increase on the previous year. The trailing 12-month free cash flow was $494 million compared to $465 million in the prior year. At the end of the quarter, we had $197 million in cash and marketable investments. Our total debt at quarter end was $1.96 billion with a weighted average interest rate of 5.2%. Currently, 66% of our total debt is fixed rate. Our floating debt is prepayable at any time and gives us the flexibility to use free cash flow to reduce outstanding floating debt balances in future periods. Turning to return of capital, we bought back 78,000 shares in the first quarter at an average price of $915 per share. At the end of the quarter, we had $49 million remaining on the board authorization, and as Will mentioned, we subsequently bought additional shares in January, exhausting the authorization. And this week, we announced a new $500 million repurchase authorization and we continue to view share repurchases as an attractive use of cash. And with that, I'll turn it back to Will for his final thoughts. Thanks, Steve. I am excited about our traction as we continue to drive more innovation than ever. In the SCORES business, our financial inclusion efforts continue as we launched a FICO score aimed at helping Ukrainian refugees displaced through the war have access to credit. Additionally, we added our third historically black college and university, Delaware State University, as part of our FICO Educational Analytics Challenge. This is a program created to help promote diversity in data science, engineering, and technology. In the software business, we added 20 new enhancements to the FICO platform and expanded our patent footprint to over 220 patents by adding 10 patents related to digital decisioning, fraud detection, machine learning, and responsible AI. And this innovation will be on display at FICO World 2024, where we will showcase how FICO truly supercharges our clients' digital transformations. At this four-day event, which uh, takes place in April, we'll bring together industry professionals from around the world to connect, share best practices, and learn how FICO enables organizations to power customer connections at scale. We will highlight successful clients and demonstrate the power of the FICO platform, enabling companies to operationalize analytics, become more composable, and make better decisions at scale. With that, I'll turn the call back to Dave, and we'll open up the Q&A session. Thanks, Will. This concludes our prepared remarks, and we're now ready to take questions. Operator, please open the line. Thank you so much. If you would like to register a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. And our first question is from the line of Faiza Alwi from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Yes, hi, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so I first wanted to ask about software. You touched on this a little bit, but give us, uh, give us a bit more color on the software uh, pipeline. As you said, you do have FICO World coming up. So you know, what are some of the new things that we should watch for? And as part of that, if you can address, you know, some seasonality in the business, because we had a bit of a step down in ARR. Uh, so talk a bit about what your expectations are for ARR as we move through the year. Is the step down more seasonal, or should we expect sort of more of a structural slowdown? Yeah, I, I think it's not so much, well, just to take this in reverse order, not really a seasonal thing so much as it is, um, deals move around, you know, and they move from quarter to quarter. And I would say this quarter, some deals were pushed to next quarter. We don't see that as a very big deal. I mean, not something that we're focused on. Um, the pipeline is the strongest it has ever been. Um, and it's also the most mature it's ever been. So I would say, you know, in terms of the stages of the pipeline, we're seeing more 
um, maturity in within the pipeline than than we have in years past. So uh, we're actually feeling really good about the pipeline. Um, in terms of what to expect at FICO World, I think that you'll have uh, what we traditionally do, which is take you through the latest and greatest uh, in, in innovation from FICO. Um, we are also going to see a lot of customers um, who are delighted to stand up in front of their peers and explain all the value that they're getting out of the FICO platform. So I, I think you'll see just a, a lot of reference customers. And, you know, part of FICO world is not just a sales event for us. It's, it's really an event for our customers to, to help sell to one another because they wind up being our best references. And so it's, it's a place where uh, best practices get passed around. And, um, and, and there's, you know, a lot of adoption of FICO technology there. Great. Thank you. And then just switching on the score side, I wonder if anything has changed as it relates to your, you know, volume expectations for 2024. You know, there has been, since, since, we, since you last reported earnings and gave the guide, it seems like the overall environment might be trending a little bit better. There's at least some more optimism. Um, so I'm curious if, you know, any, anything was different uh, as it relates to your expectations in the quarter itself and how you're thinking about, about volumes going, going forward. So we're, we're very comfortable with our guidance, and we, you know, we continue to see, um, you know, volumes roughly where we expected, frankly. I'm not sure I agree with, uh, with, with the view that there's more optimism. I mean, rates have ticked up in mortgages recently. And so, you know, if anything, I, I guess I feel like, um, uh, you know, the, the rate, the, the, the fall in rates might be slower than a lot of industry pundits had been forecasting. That said, as you know, FICO is always very conservative in our view about these things. And so I wouldn't say that we're caught in any way by, you know, by a little uptick in rates or by um, slowness in rates coming down. There's no question that we'll benefit tremendously as volumes increase when rates come down. Um, and, and, you know, we anticipate that within the year and within next year. Um, but, but I would say, you know, right now, no change in our, in our outlook. Great. Thank you so much. And our next question is from the line of Surinder uh, Tind with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, so, Will, just another follow-up question on the software business. Can you talk a little bit about, I guess, the pipeline when it comes to kind of new clients? Uh, when I do the math, it looks like the pace at which new clients are bringing on ARR has been slowing for a number of quarters now. Uh, just any color on, on your ability to bring on board new clients at this point? We, we have not had any challenges bringing on new clients. I mean, we, you know, our, as our penetration goes up, uh, you know, we, we will have captured more and more of our target enterprise uh, customer base and more and more of the the growth will be from the expand part of the the expand part of the business, with, you know, which is more use cases and more volume with existing customers. Um, it does take some time to onboard, so it doesn't always show up, you know, instantly. But uh, but I would I think what you're going to see over time is a is a mixed shift from land to expand. Although we're not having any trouble landing, we continue to land new customers. Yeah, I would just say, Surinder, to, you know, when we find somebody that's really new, the, the, the lead time is longer on them than an existing customer. So that's why you, you, you'll see some of that. But, um, you know, we still sign a lot of new deals with a lot of new customers or at least, you know, different use cases with customers that are using some of our, you know, legacy products. Got it. And then in terms of just the, the color around the margins in the software business at this point, um, when I kind of go through the numbers, um, sounds like you've built in all of the what you kind of need for this year in terms of your guide. Um, so does that mean that incremental revenues, should they show up, generally will drop to the bottom line, or how should we think about things like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think in general that's a fair statement. Um, we're pretty comfortable with where the margins are and our expenses are running in line with what we expect and what we forecast and what we planned for. And so what you said is, is largely right. You know, incremental revenue should fall through the bottom line. That said, 
um, you know, as incremental revenue comes in, we do reevaluate whether we want to devote some portion of that to additional resource for more rapid uh, development. So, you know, will 100% of it follow the bottom line? I don't know. I mean, we'll see. Thank you. And our next question is from the line of Manav Patnaik with Barclays. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, Steve, maybe just to follow up on that, if you could help with the software, um, you know, kind of cadence around the operating expense. Looks like, you know, it ticked up sequentially, maybe a little bit higher than we thought. But since everything's running in line, can you just walk us through how we should think about the the expense spend there? Yeah. So, I mean, we talked about that a little bit last quarter that, you know, we're, we're, we're making some investments. You know, there's a lot of growth here. Um, and we think there's a lot more room for growth. And, you know, we're doing some investment on the R&D side to add more functionality. And we're doing, you know, some investment on, you know, cybersecurity as well. So, so there is some investment coming in there. There's a lot of different moving parts this quarter because you've got, you know, we, we had the end of the year bonuses that happened too. So you, that, that rolls in here as well. So you'll probably continue to see the expenses trend up through the year as we bring more people on. We have about 100 more people today than we had a year ago. Right, so we're 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 you know, we're investing like we said in in those specific areas. So, but you, you'll you'll see the you know the expenses throughout the year trend up, but not really all that dramatically. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and then, will just in terms of the, the 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 lending commentary, I mean, I think we all have our views on mortgage. Let's put that aside for a second. But can you just walk us through what's going on in? auto and card, you know, with both those down three and five percent, just, you know, in any anything to call out there and what the you know, what the outlook for 24 is really for those two categories? I, you know, I don't have a lot of additional to add there. I mean, it's it's down a little bit and, you know, again, not a gigantic surprise to us. I think we're very kind of comfortable with that. It's, it's within our kind of range of forecast. So not not con we don't wouldn't consider it a big surprise. And in terms of um, guessing about the future, honestly, Manav, your guess is as good as ours. But you, you, we're, as you know, we're a, a trailing indicator. Yep, fair enough. Thank you. And our next question is from the line of Kyle Peterson with Needham. Please go ahead. Great. Uh, thanks, guys. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to continue on, you know, the expenses and kind of, you know, what you guys saw, um, you know, this quarter, I guess, uh, in terms of mix of revenue, it looks like, you know, there's a lower amount of you know, professional services, which you usually would think of as kind of a, a bit of a drag on expenses. So I just want to see, you know, how should we should think about, you know, the relationship between, you know, services, revenue, and, you know, some of these buckets versus, you know, the expense growth, like is is there any lag, or, or how should we think about some of the puts and takes there? No, yeah, I mean, so the professional services piece is, is a little, maybe a little bit unique because most of the PS work is done by internal resources. So in some cases, if they're not working on billable deals, they're working on R&D. In some cases, we've you know, moved people into that function as well. So those costs don't necessarily go away. Um, you know, our, the professional services piece for us really is, you know, most of its implementation work that we do on the software side. So we don't really look at that necessarily as a you know as a profit center, but you know in terms of as a as an indicator of potential expenses, I you know I think you know the PS PS tends to run in that twenty to twenty five million dollar range. Um, it was a little bit lower this quarter, but it's never going to be a lot higher because we're we're really we're kind of downplaying that aspect, and we don't have as many resources in PS as we've had in, in past years. So um, I don't think you're ever going to see that really tick up or really have much of a material impact on the overall margin of the business. Maybe just to follow up on you know, the guidance methodology, uh, particularly on the score side, things looks like uh, it sounds like your your overall revenue top line is pretty much unchanged, uh, and the and the volume assumptions seem the same. So I guess uh, could you just confirm you know on you know the pricing assumptions and kind of what maybe what actions you guys have taken um, on that front, and you know if everything the you know, went into effect on the first of the year uh, is in the guidance or, you know, if there's still kind of a wait-and-see approach with volumes? Well, I mean, there's still a lot of, obviously, a lot of volatility on the volume. So I think, you know, next quarter, yeah, all the pricing, you know, went into effect in 
first part of January, um, we'll we'll have a lot more color that we can provide next quarter because we'll see you know the impacts of all that. We'll see have a we'll be that much farther into the year, and we'll we'll know a lot more about about what volumes look like, and frankly, we'll know a lot more about what the rate environment looks like probably in three months. So we'll be able to provide more color for the rest of the year at that point. Got it. That's helpful. Thanks, guys. And our next question is from the line of George Tong with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Good afternoon. You've announced removing tiered pricing increases for mortgage scores this year. Can you talk a little bit about your pricing strategy for autos and credit cards and how pricing trends in these categories uh, will likely compare with last year? So we we um, we have adjusted prices. You you identified you highlighted probably the biggest change in pricing this year, which was collapsing the tiers in mortgage, and that was really in response to a lot of feedback from the industry um, about a level playing field, and so we accommodated that. Uh, in terms of the others, we, you know, we as you know, we adjust prices in every segment every year, and it's relatively surgical. We go pocket by pocket and, and think through what we can do. Virtually all of our scores have some level of CPI, inflation pricing adjustment, and then others get, you know, some additional beyond that uh, where we consider it appropriate. Um, I would say that we did not take very significant actions in, in auto and card, not, not, not worth calling out uh, separately and beyond kind of cost of living adjustment this year. Got it. That's helpful. And, and can you provide a little bit um, of detail around some of the real-time trends that you're seeing with mortgage inquiries and some of the real-time trends that you're seeing with uh, card volumes and auto volumes? Uh, with mortgage, I'd say the, the surprise is that we're seeing a little bit of refi activity. Um, it doesn't take very much for people to come back in the market and, and try to refinance their mortgages. And so even a point of decline is enough to generate some volume that we didn't really anticipate. Um, you know, Steve, maybe you want to comment on, on the other. Yeah, I mean, in terms of real time, frankly, most of the reporting we get is in arrears to some degree. So the, 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 the numbers you can get from you know, industry analysts are, are going to be much more real-time than what we can provide. There's a lot of industry data that's provided you know, on a weekly basis that's going to be much more real-time than what we'll be able to give you. And then any, uh, what about some of the arrears numbers that you're seeing with cards and autos? Well, I think like card was you know, running a lot hotter last year, right? I mean, coming out of when the, when the refi slowed down, there was a big pickup in, in card, and we're still seeing you know, that, that kind of slowed down then. You know, about a year ago now. Um, so, you know, it's pretty steady. I think there's been a lot of pullback on the subprime markets, um, but you know, overall, it's it's not all that materially different. The volumes are not. They'll you know they'll fluctuate a little bit depending on even what some of the bigger players might do in any one given quarter. Um, but again, that's not that you know that's probably not as across the board as mortgage, which is more more driven by consumer demand you know, that's tied to interest rates. Great. And commentary on autos? Autos, I mean, autos is relatively stable and has been through that. I mean, it's a few percent here or there, um, you know, but it, but you don't see a lot of volatility in the auto market, uh, at least on the, at least on the um, lending side. Got it. Very helpful. Thank you. And as a reminder, if you do want to ask a question, you can press the one followed by the four. And our next question is from the line of Seth Weber with Wells Fargo Securities. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to ask just to go back to the comment about some deals getting pushed uh, to the second quarter. Um, is there anything, you know, idiosyncratic that you'd call out there? Or there, is there any, you know, focus on any certain um, product, ca uh, customer categories or regions or anything that, um, you know, you'd, you'd um, you know, you attribute that to, or, you know, are you just seeing an, ex an elongation of the sales cycle? Because I think in prior quarters, you guys had talked about a shortening of the sales cycle. So just trying to understand if there's any kind of bigger change that's going on here. Thanks. No, not really. I mean, the sales cycle is roughly where it's been lately, which is shorter than where it was a year or two years ago. Um, I would say that, uh, 
I really, I mean, just there's nothing special there. The we, we it's probably worth reiterating that FICO, unlike a lot of other software companies, doesn't do a lot of wheeling and dealing at the end of the quarter to pull in business, and it is cultural with us. You know, our 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 salespeople and all of our employees you know, really live, act, believe in our number one corporate value, which is act like an owner. Uh, we, you know, we are really truly aligned with shareholders. We think about it as a family business. And, and that includes the salespeople at end of quarter. And that's not to say that we don't make a push at the end of the quarter to close business. Obviously, we do, like everyone. But what's not on the table is a bunch of extra discounting and Hail Mary type stuff just to pull something in a week earlier. We, I mean, we just don't care. And, um, and you'll never find FICO making radical concessions at quarter end to, you know, to, uh, to, to, to prop up a quarterly number. It's just not who we are. And so, you know, it's just worth keeping that in mind. So when we say yeah. deals move from quarter to quarter, it has more to do with the client and their budget timeline and their approval process than it has to do with anything else. Yeah, and I would just say practically, we had some deals that, we didn't sign that last week of December just because it was hard to get people, right? I mean, we, yeah, you run into this issue every December that you might have people that are uh, you know, on vacation or traveling. You just can't get this, you know, the ink on the paper. So some of these deals have actually closed in January. So, I, you know, I don't, again, from Will's point of view, that's a great point. We, we, we're not scrambling trying to do everything humanly possible to get the deal signed in the last week of December as opposed to the first week of January. Got it. Okay. That, that's helpful. Thanks. And then just, you know, can you, just expanding on that a little bit, can you, um, you know, just update us on any traction that you're seeing, you know, whatever traction you're seeing kind of outside the financial services area for the platform business and, um, you know, whether you're seeing bigger uptake there from non-traditional customers? Yeah, I would say that our platform business is still very much focused on financial services. Um, the, uh, the, the, the business we do outside financial services today, you know, we do, we do close, closely aligned stuff like insurance. We do that. Um, but, but in terms of really non-financial services verticals, um, I would say that the, the lion's share of that is in the optimization area, you know, where we have the world's leading optimization engine. And so it's used by airlines and retailers and all kinds of, you know, sports scheduling and all kinds of places that are not as typical, you know, when you think of FICO. Um, that said, you know, our strategy around non-financial services is very much to go there through partners. We have a really robust and growing and, and ever stronger um, indirect sales force where, where our partners focus on both geography and the and geographies where we're not so present and on, you know, partners in geographies where we're not present and then on uh, verticals where we're not as, as uh, represented. And, um, and I think you'll see as our, as our strategy evolves and, and you've heard us talk about, you know, building an open ecosystem for, with a decisioning platform available to any, any B2C company interested in using it. That, that's, that's happening this year. I mean, we will have open APIs this year. We will have software development kits for ISVs and retailers and bars and, and uh, those who want to take our decisioning solutions to other verticals. So you, you'll see that starting to happen this year, uh, but that's really our strategy is to do that through partners. It's not much that, there's not much of that that we do directly. Got it. Okay. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. And our next question comes from the line of Ashish Sabadra with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, just a quick question on the mortgage volume. Did you provide uh, the, what the mortgage uh, volume growth was in the first quarter of 24? We just no, we just talked about much... the revenues. We don't, we don't pull out the different components in terms of the volumes. But, I mean, you can get the volumes from, you know, other third-party sources pretty easily. Okay. No, that's helpful. Uh, and then maybe on the, uh, the headwind from the LATAM license revenue, can you just remind us how much was that? revenue in the prior year, 1Q23, or how should we think about the growth in the business excluding that one-time headwind? And then as we go through the rest of the year, uh, just curious if there's any other license renewal headwind to be cognizant of. Thanks. There's potentially license. I mean, well, the renewals are hard to, are hard to, um, hard to project, frankly. Um, 
because uh, you know we don't know when they're going to renew, or you, you know sometimes they'll renew early, sometimes they will renew later if they'll, if they'll you know take on additional pieces. So the renewal pieces is difficult. I mean, if you look at the the next couple of quarters, we had some pretty big point in time revenue last year in Q2 and Q3. Um, so you know we may not have that again uh, this year. Sometimes we have renewals that end up moving to the platform and they end up becoming ratable revenue, so they don't have upfront license revenue. So we're actively trying to move people. Uh, obviously, to the platform, which you know we, we, we forego the upfront license revenue in, in favor of recurring revenue. So you know, as those happen, you're going to see changes there. Um, you know, that's typical to, to companies that are moving a ratable revenue, but it's been less dramatic for us because we've done over time. But there's always the p- potential that you're going to see that, and you'll have to think about that as, as different quarters come up. Thank you. Thanks. And our next question comes from the line of Jeff Mueller with Baird. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I didn't understand the answer on the last question. The, the LAT AM renewal in the year ago, that was in scores, not software, correct? Yeah, that was in scores. I'm sorry. That, that was in scores. And the, the, ones in, the, the ones in scores happen occasionally. Um, you know, we'll have, we'll have license deals. Typically, they're foreign deals um, in areas where, you know, a, a, a large bank wants to, you know, build their own score model. Um, and we'll and we'll sign you know deals with them. So that in, within scores we occasionally have those, and it's difficult to again even with those it's difficult to know what the you know what the time is going to be. Okay, and then just trying to I guess probably the last question as well like the 21% growth in B2B scores last quarter, 12% growth this quarter. How much of that slowdown is just due to the LAT AM comp in the year ago, um, or anything else that you can say on? like non-origination revenue trends because yeah. it doesn't look like yeah, a lot it's of slowing. Primarily it's, kind of due to la- it's, due to, it's, it's completely due to LATAM and, and lower mortgage volumes in Q1 versus Q4, right? I mean, that's we're, we're, we're volume takers, obviously, right? I mean, if, if the volumes are down, which they're going to be, they're going to be anyway seasonally at that quarter. The, the December quarter has fewer mortgages typically than the September quarter does. Um, so it's, it's the combination of those two things. Outside of originations, it was up slightly. The non-origination business was up slightly, but not all that significant. Okay. And then can you just help me with, like, any rough order of magnitude of sizing? If I look at mortgage, your mortgage origination revenue, roughly how much of it comes from closed loans versus – things like rate shopping or applications that don't result in a closed loan or anything else that would like fall in we, that bucket? Yeah, frankly, we don't know because we don't, I mean, actually, I think if you have to ask the bureaus, they'll tell you the same thing. Um, you know, the bundles get pulled, uh, you know, for, for with scores and data, and they don't necessarily know, nobody necessarily knows if the actual lender knows if it was closed or not. Um, so we don't really know. Um, you know whether the whether they turned into a closed loan or not. That's not reported to us. Okay, thank you. And our next question is from the line of Rajiv Bhatia with Morningstar. Please go ahead. Hey, good evening, and sorry if I missed it, but can you provide what percentage of your scores revenue was mortgage in the quarter? Like I know you you've provided that in previous quarters. Yeah, we didn't provide that. Um, I, I don't have that number in front of me. What, what, what the percentage was, um, so I, 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 yeah, we don't, we didn't. Occasionally, we will do that. We didn't provide that this quarter. So you could probably back into it if you took the numbers we gave you um, from last year, and then the percentage increases. Uh, okay, yeah, we can follow up, I guess. I and mean, then I know we talked about like the Latin America, you know, kind of scores license. But if I look at like the Asia score uh, score revenue in your 10K or 10Q. You know, it was, it was, I think, 5.9 yep. million and, you know, definitely more than 4.1 million for, the, for all of fiscal 2023. So, I guess, is that like... Yeah, that we, had a, like we had a license, license deal in Asia where, in scores. So, we had a much larger one in Latin America last year. And then we... If you look at it in any given, any given quarter, you know, probably half the time we have a license deal somewhere. Um, but, uh, obviously, the total license deals this year were much smaller this year than they were last year. And that was because of the Latin American deal. Okay, thank you. 
And at this time, there are no more questions in the queue. I will now conclude the call. So thank you, everyone, for joining today's call. This does conclude the conference call. And we thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines.